Welcome to another episode of At the Table with Patrick Lincioni, the official podcast of our company, The Table Group, where everything we do is about changing the world so that all organizations can be more effective and less dysfunctional, and employees can be more fulfilled and less miserable. That means we're going to be touching on a variety of topics, all related in some way to the world of work. So I'm your host, Pat Lincioni, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Cody Thompson, Still here, Pat. Still here. And we have a guest here, Amy Hyatt, one of the co-founders of The Table Group, and currently our head of marketing. Hello, everyone. All right. We're going to tell some old stories. We got Tracy Noble, our producer, and our boss in the room, too. She's going to come on later for a special segment. That's right. But right now, Cody, jump us into our topic. So we're going to talk about, the title is One Bad Apple. And essentially what it is, when you have one person on a team the potential impact that that one person can have and what sort of actions people should take to either get them aligned or remove them from the team. Right. Cause it comes back to that one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. Exactly. Yep. And, and Pat just wrote about this for chief executive magazine and we will be getting that link out as soon as we have show notes, which we're working on. <laughs> that's right? your job, right? No, yes, no, that's, <laughs> it is my job. <laughs> all right. We're working on show notes for all of you people out there that ask us for show notes. And just before we get in, I do have one other piece of housekeeping here. So I would love it. We've been doing, we're on our 25th episode here. This is our 25th all episode right. of the podcast. We have gotten such great feedback. We're excited to be it's doing growing this. A lot. It's growing. More and more people are listening to it. Um, it's showing up in polls all over, which we love. Exactly. And really, it goes back to what you opened the show with, Pat, that we really are doing this to help leaders and teams and organizations transform the world of work. So, to give them practical advice. Exactly. And so if you're listening to this and you haven't gone on, this is a totally shameless plug, but if you if you haven't gone on and rated and reviewed the podcast, what that does, the reason we're asking you to do that is what it does is it bumps it up in all these feeds and all the search criteria so that more and more people who are interested in this type of content can actually get their hands on this, participate in the conversation, and ultimately join the movement we're trying to create around this. And it helps so much. We do read all of your comments and we try to take your suggestions to heart. So please comment, rate, and review. That's right. We love it. And if you do have questions, we're going to be covering some at the end, podcast at tablegroup.com. Okay, that's the only commercial. I won't interrupt anymore. All right. One bad apple, Pat, take it away. Yeah, so this is one of those things that every time I speak to a group of CEOs and I ask them the question, how many people here have tolerated a person's bad behavior for a long time that you knew you needed to move on or just hesitated when you know you needed to take action? And every hand goes up. There's no hesitation. There's a pained look on everybody's face because... Every leader goes through this. Why did I keep that person for so long? And it's one of those things, the cost of this is huge, and yet it's so prevalent. So we thought we should talk about that. Why do so many leaders, myself included, occasionally hesitate, delay, and avoid dealing with that person on the team that just doesn't fit and that creates problems? Right. And this is why I think the Apple analogy is so good is because it really does spoil the whole bunch. If it were just one bad team member whose actions kind of only affected them. The cost of this is so high. Yep. And not just for the members of that team, but for the organization, for the bottom line. You know, people talk about toxic people on teams and and really it is it infects the rest of the team and the rest of the organization. Yeah, and it usually comes down to a person who's insecure, invulnerable, can't admit when they don't know something and everybody has to kind of dance around that issue. And of course, one of the first examples of this that I like to talk about in my talks is an executive team I worked with that had this one person on the team. She could never admit she was wrong. She could never acknowledge somebody had a better idea. They kept her for a long time. Finally, the CEO managed her off the team. And the very next meeting, it was like the entire team had changed completely. Hmm. And I remember that's how I learned one person on a team who doesn't fit, they can change the entire dynamic. And when you finally move them out, everything else gets better. And it's not always a big thing. It can be a subtle thing. Like in the case of the example you're, you're stating where she just couldn't be vulnerable. Right. And therefore the other people around her couldn't be vulnerable. It's not like she was a horrible person or yeah. And sometimes it's actually not just a problem with vulnerability, but just cultural fit. Right. Right. But whatever it is, when you ask CEOs, they will tell you after the fact, Oh, I've always known this. It's driven me crazy. I knew I needed to do something about it. I just didn't. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that almost everyone who's listening to this is thinking, you know, uh, somebody in their course of their career pops into their brain. You know, like I think almost every person has worked on a team where generally they know who the bad apple is and how many of those people worked on that team or got promoted 
you know, those apples tend to hang around way longer than they should in almost every industry and every team. And we make excuses. That's exactly as fellow team members or as leaders by saying, oh, well, this is why, or that person's just unhappy, but they'll get better, or I don't have time or energy to deal with this, or what. And of course, to get to the end of this, the problem is everyone suffers. Right. Everyone ends up suffering. The team suffers, that person suffers, the leader suffers. But before we get into that, let's just talk about some good examples of this. Good okay. idea. Great. You know, and, and it's fun to pull in. We like to pull in examples from outside of business. Now, I will start with my own. I once did this. Um, somebody reminded me of this today. <laughs> I once had somebody that I was managing who really got a lot of work done, but it was not a cultural fit. And I knew it and everybody else knew it. But I just didn't want to let this person go because, and this was before we started the table group, because I just thought I needed them. And when I finally, when somebody on my team finally came to me and said, you realize that person's not a cultural fit and you're keeping them around. When I finally took action, everybody else's performance improved. Hmm. And yet it took me a long time to do it. Yeah. Tell them what you did before you took action. Yes. Oh, I wonder who brought this up earlier. (laughs) And that's, I promoted her. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I knew she didn't fit, but she'd got so much done. She did get a lot done. Yeah. She was whip smart. Yeah, she really was. Yeah. And and the thing is when I finally let her go to another part of the organization, cause it was a big company, she was very successful. She just didn't belong on our team and why I didn't see that sooner. Well, that's what happens when we're leaders. We make excuses and we try to avoid that. Well, and I, there's, I think in most cases there's some justification there. If it were, if everything were bad, then they would not be on teams. Right. And so, well, sometimes even that happens, but right. usually there's a reason. And, right. and and one could be, like you said, their their work is stellar. They get a lot done. You and I actually were consulting to a small startup. Well, actually, two different examples. One was a nonprofit. And two of the people were friends since childhood, the CEO and then the second sort of In member command, of yeah. the executive team. And because they had been friends since childhood, they, they had a serious problem on their team because the the childhood friend was not a cultural fit. And it was a bottleneck for the entire organization. It it hampered their growth. It caused some real derision on the, the rest of the team. And ultimately, until they were able to manage that person off the team, they were they were running into like such a ceiling for their company, not just in terms of what they could their performance, but everyone was miserable coming to work. Yeah. De- because demoralizing. Of two, because of two people. Until they address that, nothing was going to change. You know, I like to look at this in the world of sports. Basketball, I like because it's five people on the court. And I think I've talked about this before, maybe on our sports podcast. The, I'm a Boston Celtic fan. Mm-hmm. I have been since I was a little kid. And a couple of years ago, they traded for a player named Kyrie Irving, who's one of the most talented players in the NBA, but not a team player, I don't think. Mm-hmm. And so they traded for this guy. He got hurt. And so he wasn't going to play that year. And they almost went to the championship. He came back the next year and they were not near as good on the court. And I would go on the like message board and I would put in there that, you know, this guy's hurting the team and he'd score a ton of points, but he'd never passed the ball and nobody actually wanted to play hard with him. And people would flame me, you know, like, (laughs) oh, you don't know what you're talking about. This guy's one of the best players ever. I said, but they're not doing as well. Is that when they said, hey, you, you took the name of that management Guru, yeah. yeah, they're like they didn't think I was using my real to name. Be the guy that wrote the book on teamwork, what a troll! <laughs> You're a troll. <laughs> well, this year they traded the guy. They're they're doing great again. Yeah. And the point is, one person on a team who doesn't fit, who's either selfish or insecure, or doesn't know how to be on a team, or just doesn't fit the culture, it brings everything down. Even in in something where somebody is so talented, sometimes there's addition by subtraction. And so many leaders just don't trust that. That's right. And that's such a great example because that person is still scoring like 50 points in some games in the NBA. And and so many people look at that and they're like, well, how could a team possibly be better if he wasn't on it? And it really is about how every other member of the team will step up. It, it, it's a huge drag on the culture to have even one member that can't participate behaviorally in the way the team should function. But you know, the general manager of the team and the coach were like, well, we traded for this guy and we can't give up on him. and It's going to look stupid. And it's like, it really does come down to having the courage to say, this isn't a fit. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy to do. I like to think about it in terms of music groups too. Like when you think about these rock bands, you know, these one hit wonders that make it, and you think, well, man, maybe they weren't very creative. Well, usually they just didn't get along and it broke up. Mm-hmm. And one of my very favorite movies in the whole world 
is called That Thing You Do. Tom Hanks is Tom in Hanks, it. He was yeah. one of the people that made and it. And Liv Tyler, your other yeah, favorite. Yeah, she's very, very pretty. M- my wife listens to this podcast. So, you know, I think she's <laughs> she's a lovely woman. Anyway, but it's about this group that comes together that sings this great song. And if you've not seen the movie That Thing You Do, go see it. And if you love it as much as I do, and I'm sure you will, please email me and tell me that. So anyway, in the movie, though, they have this great song, but there's this one guy in the band who's all about himself. Mm-hmm. And at the end, it, 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 it just... They disintegrate. And this happens so much in work and in sports and in music. And people underestimate the dynamics on a team. And they'll constantly justify keeping that one difficult person. Well, right. and endless examples here in the Silicon Valley of like that founder that that starts a company, whether it's Uber or someone like that, where they just don't know how to to build a culture and 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 get the, the right people on the bus. And now, so... What this can make us think about is you got to fire people more. Right. Mm-hmm. The first thing you have to do, though, is you got to confront the problem. Because we, we're working with one very big company right now who one of the executives has been a problem on the team. And the CEO, as a result of talking through this, we started working with them. He confronted this person and said, this is how you're perceived and this is what's going on. And these are my concerns about you and your, and your life. And it looks like the guy's making a change. Well, yeah. and, and he just didn't know. Right. I mean, I, I know it's kind of hard to believe that, but no one had really sat him down and told him this. And this is a huge company and a very accomplished executive. Right. And sometimes you just need to tell them the truth. Yeah, right. I think it begs the question. So if every single person that you can think of probably knows a bad apple or has yep. worked with one in their career, and there's, this is so prevalent, and, it does, and we understand the weight of it, the cost of keeping someone around so, so like the drastic cost of that, then it begs the question, why? Why do right. people not, why do team members, team leaders not address this, like this example that you have? What's preventing people from going to the bad apple and, and trying to have some productive conversation around their behaviors? Right. And it's, it's perplexing, except the good news is I've been one of those people and I think I know what went through my mind. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't want to do anything because you think it might not be nice. It might not be fair. And you're like, gee, that, I would feel really terrible. Or maybe I'm wrong that. about them. Right. Or maybe I'm wrong. You doubt, right. you doubt right. whether or not. Maybe, maybe I'm not seeing something. Right. Very common people have good intentions and they don't want to do anything if they're not sure. Right. If they're not sure. So that's one thing. More often, it's because it's going to be uncomfortable and messy and they think, oh, I'm just going to look at something else right now. I don't want to have to go there. Right. It's going to be such an uncomfortable process. And so I think people just say, it's, it, I don't want to enter the danger on this. That's right. The, the next is, of course, the, you know, I think of that early client that we had that had that chief operating officer that wasn't a fit. Yeah. And he, was, he said, she's the air that I breathe. Right. I mean, she, and what he meant by that is she gets so much done She is there every day, all the time, and I rely on her to do a ton of work. And what they're doing is the bad economics of not understanding the impact that that person has on everybody else's work. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happened with me until I had moved this person out. I didn't realize how everybody else on my team was was set back. And when I finally moved them on, everybody else's performance went up. And this is what happens all the time. Now, so whether it's because you don't want to be mean or because you don't want to do something messy, or you're afraid that person gets so much done that what are you going to do without them? Those are the reasons that people don't do this. Right. When I work with CEOs, the thing I try to explain to them to give them the courage to do this is I say, you realize what's going to happen. If you don't move that person out or confront them and help them get better, your best people are going to leave first. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine has an organization and she hired somebody who didn't fit, she lost two of her best executives until they finally moved the other person out. And the idea of losing good people because you're tolerating mediocre or, or difficult people is one of the things that then can get even the wussiest leaders to take action. That's so right. painful. It's so painful. Well, and, and it does beg the question. I mean, this sort of toes the line around accountability, what we talk about accountability. And, and I think that one thing that Pat, one thing that Pat says regularly is when you talk to executives, I, I love when you do this bit on, on stage during your speech around the five dysfunctions, when you say, oh no, executives will often say, no, I, I, I'm good at accountability. Just point to someone and I'll fire them, you know, right. and they think that it is just about firing them. And what we talk about all the time is 
that behaviors precede results, right? Yeah. And so in this case, what we're talking about is actually going to the bad apple, not around results necessarily, but behaviors that are inhibiting the team. Absolutely. An unwillingness to be vulnerable, an avoidance of conflict, unwillingness to commit, like those sort of things that that spoil the whole team. I think it is true that that executives and other team members would hold each other more readily hold each other accountable for results. Like, oh, you didn't hit your sales numbers or right. oh, Something you didn't turn tangible. in that thing on time. Mm-hmm. But it's really way more difficult to go in to someone and say, hey, the way that you show up in that meeting where you dismiss everyone's feedback, yeah, that's being a really big drain on our productive conversation. Right. You know, the the, the thing at the end of this, and I mentioned this earlier, we have to keep in mind is this. When you finally let that person go after you've confronted them and and they've proved that they don't fit or they don't have what it takes to to become more vulnerable or secure, when you finally let them go, they're actually relieved. Right. Because they need to work someplace that has different standards. And so that sometimes I, I guess if a person is worried about being mean, it's like you're actually causing that person to suffer more than they should by not taking action. That sometimes that's helps right. them. Yeah. Right. And w- that's I think that helps me a lot to realize they're going to be fine. In fact, they're probably coming to work pretty miserable knowing that they don't fit. And the longer you drag that out, the worse their misery gets. That's right. In fact, I was just going to ask you, Pat and Cody, because you guys are good at at these kinds of conversations. If an executive comes to you and says, hey, I have this person on my team that's struggling. Can you help me talk to them? Can you just talk to the listener about how you would approach a problem like that? Well, I, I, you know, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to try to understand what it must be like to be them, but you got to know, do they understand it? Right. Do they really get it? And what's awful is when people are walking around in a company and they're that person and nobody's told them. Exactly. How painful. Yeah. And then if they do know, I mean, again, we're seeing this right now. Sometimes they go, I I had no idea. I'm going to change. I can't believe no one told me. Right. Sometimes the best thing you can tell somebody too is like, it's okay if you leave. If, if you can't do this, we'll help you find another job someplace right, else. Right. I love when you say, we'll make you available to the market. Yeah, That's that was right. Bobby Herrera, one of our guests who said that. That's right. They need to be made available to the market, but it really makes sense. It's like right. somebody else is going to value them. Definitely. Well, and they really can go somewhere else and be so much happier. Yes, especially today with a job market the way right. it is today. And so when you're keeping somebody around that doesn't fit or that doesn't work on the team, Wow, that doesn't make any sense for anybody. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I want to read a little excerpt from the chief executive article that you wrote here. You say that they, the team, the team leader, anyone must quickly, consistently, and persistently call out team members who are disingenuous, evasive, or passive aggressive. Like the the quickly, consistently, and persistently, persistently. call it out. Yeah. And then you go on to say, when a difficult team member doesn't change his or her behavior after being reminded again and again, CEOs must sit down with that executive in kindness and respect and let him or her know that the decision is clear. You can commit to change or you can choose to leave. Right. And you know, it, Alan right. Malala used to say, hey, you don't have to work here. Right. We can still be yeah. friends though. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. And that's true. And so yet, joyful. I think it usually comes down to the, the person who, the leader not having the stomach for this. That's right. I think it's a matter of having courage and wisdom. Well, and really realizing it's the kindest thing to do, right? To get them either to perform at the level you want them to or to move out of the organization. You know, I will say this. I will say there's a period there and sometimes it's longer than others where you're neither rewarded for doing it and it's, it hasn't taken effect. Like once I remember I took over a department before we started the table group and I had, there was an employee that everybody hated working with. Very difficult person. I remember that. And so when I took over that department, the first thing I do is I sat down with that person and I knew that, I mean, this was years going by Mm -hmm. and people had tolerated this person for far too long. And I finally managed that person out of the organization because Mm -hmm. it was long overdue. Right. And I kind of thought people were going to come to my office and go, you're our hero. Right. But the first reaction was, I can't believe you did that. Right. Well, because they start to think you're going to do that to them maybe in that instance anyway. Yeah. I don't know what it was. And it it took a few weeks before people came and said, I'm glad you finally dealt with that because nobody else did. (laughs) Right. But that's the hard thing about being a leader. When you move that person out, Sometimes the first reaction isn't to lift you up, you know, on your shoulders and parade you around the office. They feel bad for that person or maybe the most outspoken person is the one person in the organization that defended them. That's right. And so you got to be willing to do it because you know it's in the right interest of the team, even if you have to suffer for a while for doing it. Absolutely. You know, 
And it, I, I think it just goes back to the analogy in general. If you do not confront the bad apple, it will spoil all the other apples mm-hmm. in the in the basket. You and know? that ties to our new book, The Motive. But we'll talk about that in future podcasts. <laughs> Amy, what's it like being that person that doesn't fit into the organization? We've been here 22 years now. We're just about ready to get on get on this with you. So what's it been like being oh. the person? <laughs> No, but that does lead Wouldn't us. that suck? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my, oh, my gosh. gosh. I'd be so horrified if you guys had these thoughts <laughs> and, you know, didn't tell me. Like, so please tell me. You know, no, probably that, all of us have been the yeah, outlier in an right. organization where it's, I mean, I once worked in, an, in a department where I was really miserable and I didn't fit. Now, my boss liked me because I actually pushed on things, but everybody else was like, this guy's driving us crazy. And so what my boss needed to do is either move them out right. or move me out right. And, stop, right. Right. and stop putting me out there. Yeah, I, I worked in an organization fun. where it was extremely data driven. You had to have s- figures and stats and everything to back up every decision you made. And for someone like me that works primarily around intuition and kind of making connections, it was not a good thing for me to be in that company. And ultimately, we parted ways. And I'm sure they got more data focused and I found you guys, which is great. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're happy uh, about that. Absolutely. So I think that's that's enough around yeah. one bad apple. Yep, that's right. Somebody else is going to eat that apple. Let them go. That's right. So let's bring in Tracy Noble because we had a while ago, we had started a segment called Consulting Corner and it was just you and I. We I would take calls or questions from the listeners and and put you across the table and say, fire off, you know, right, go, right, right. And then because we're both ENFPs and we have almost zero structure around this, that follow through that, <laughs> that ended up disappearing over time. You forgot. And yeah, basically. I forgot. And then Tracy was like, Hey, who has access to the emails from the listeners? And I said, just me. And she said, that's a problem. And so she got access. <laughs> You're welcome. So now it, it's back. It's back. So we have consulting corner and consulting it's going to be a more consistent yes. part of our podcast now. And if they forget, you can email us and tell us. That's yes. right. That's podcast right. at tablegroup.com. So, so we've got Tracy some questions. Some questions. Yep. Yes, I've got three great questions for you guys today. So Alan, our friend Alan, he's the founder of a small business. He's really good at working in the business, but not on the business. Right. He asks, is there a guide for small business owners struggling to see the steps for building healthy organizations? Good question. Is there a guide? Is there a guide? He's looking for a guide. Well, or a guy. Or a guy. Yeah, yeah or a consultant. <laughs> We've got guy. both. Yeah, or a gal. You know, for, of our books, there's a, the book, The Advantage. Because what I would say to Alan is first start with your team. Make sure you have a good team. And then make sure they're aligned. Make sure there's no daylight between them about what they think the business is about. That's the most critical thing you have to do in an organization like that. And so the best guide we know of is the advantage, the book, because it's very action oriented. You can go through, read a couple of the chapters and really get that done. So that's that what I would do. What do you have, Cody? We're going to send him a copy. I I hear that a lot, though. I think a a lot of people resonate, especially in small businesses where you wear multiple hats and you're working in the business and on the business. Right. And really, we talk a lot about the effectiveness versus efficiency sort of conversation where when you're a small company, you think we just have to be efficient. We have to get a lot of stuff done. And really it can take a day or two days to get your leadership team away from the actual in the business work and work on the business and what it will do for your productivity and alignment and clarity for all of your employees is far more than what you could have been getting done in that amount of time. Yeah. And just to be clear, we're not talking about getting off site and catching each another catching each other falling out off a chair or out of a tree. We're talking about getting off site and really working on your relationships and your clarity and making sure you're all aligned. And you're right. Most teams that we work with, when they do this, they say, we got more done today or in these two days than we would have if we'd been back in the office. But it takes some courage to do that. Yep. Absolutely. Slow down to go fast, as they say in race car driving. That's great. All right. So next question is from Greg. Greg is on the leadership team at a company with a phenomenal mission statement that no one follows and values that don't mean anything. He describes the environment as toxic. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, not good. He says, how do I begin to effectively change the health of the organization when my peers don't understand or value the concepts? Wow. I'll I'll let you take that one. Yeah. (laughs) That's a big one. I would say the good news is this. If you do something and it may, becomes clear that you don't belong there, that's probably not bad news because mm-hmm. moving on from right. that organization. But what you might as well do when you're there is do something that Stephen Covey talks about, which is focus on your circle of influence. Mm-hmm. And that's do everything you can in the area of the business that you control and see if people notice 
or just speak the kind truth to power, if you will, and go to people in the organization and kindly, humbly say, I think we need to address this. Most human beings in their careers, when they make a real difference, have a moment where they take the courage to stand up and say, the emperor has no clothes. And somebody says, thank you for doing that. And many times it's the emperor. So I would say, what's this person's name? Greg. Greg. I would say, Greg, what do you got to lose? Mm -hmm. Now, don't go light yourself on fire and go into the office and say, you're a real a-hole. You know what I mean? Go there and say, hey, I think that there's some problems here. I don't think this is consistent. I don't think this is consistent. I really want to help. And I'm not here to tell you that you're, you're an idiot. I'm here to tell you that this is pretty common in many organizations. And if you want me to help you, I will. If they do... You're going to be a hero and it'll be the best experience in your career. Mm -hmm. If they don't want you to, then you'll know. Polish up that resume resume. and kindly find another place to be. You know, but I actually love getting these questions because so often we get people that say, what if I'm not the leader? I care about this stuff, but I'm not the leader. How do I influence it? And, And while I know that situation is frustrating for whoever's experiencing it, it gives me and us a lot of hope that there's these aspiring leaders out there that that know that the health of the organization is paramount, you know, and yep. that that if you continue to be persistent about that and you continue to sort of t- um, take that message and infect the things that you can control, your own team, your own department, that ultimately they'll find themselves in positions of leadership in the future and will accomplish what we're set out setting out to do, which is change the world of work. Like exactly. we need more people out there that get this stuff and want to not have a heartless mission statement. You know, and I think it's important to understand this. And I believe this. If the world is made up of 10 leaders, you know, two or three of them are great. Two or three of them don't want to hear any of this. Mm -hmm. The other five or six have never had anybody come to them and say, I will help you. Mm -hmm. Right. They're either being told what they want to hear or they're, they don't have anybody around them that's being honest. And so, I mean, again, I like to say this in my career. I think the most important thing I did is I went into leaders and told them the kind truth. And most times, more often than not, they rewarded me for that. So I say, go for it, Greg, and let us know how it goes. Yeah, that's great. All right. Our final question comes from Joanne. And Joanne's on an executive team that has experienced some turnover. And they are looking to hire two new executives. And she wants advice from you on how to find an executive that embraces organizational health. Wow. Well, I think the question is probably, do they have the capacity for for it? I mean, certainly you can go and say, have you read this book? And you do this already, (laughs) but that's not easy to do. And I I think the thing, what you need to do is kind of introduce them to some of the concepts in the interview process and see if they resonate with those. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most important thing. Yeah. And it's like, this is the kind of organization we are building. And if you don't want to be part of this, you will be miserable here. Mm -hmm. It's like the kill them with clarity or, or whatever. Scare them with some 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 sincerity. That's That's a new one. We'll coin that one too. Kill them with clarity. I almost had it. (laughs) But I think, I think also that what you can look for is, especially at the executive level, if someone is just interested, if you're hiring the head of sales, for example, and they just talk about the sales department in the interview, then they may not view the executive team as like, this is my number one team where we're steering the organization, you know, so people that are, that are interested in being on the executive team because it's steering the company and not just steering their department would probably be one way to kind of know really whether or not they're point. open to OH or, or mm-hmm. have a natural tendency to care about the culture and those sort of things. Yeah. Ask them in their old jobs, did they get involved in areas outside of their own? Mm-hmm. And if the answer is no, ask them, is that something, you know, I, I think there's a way to bring these things up. It's not about tricking people in the interview. It's about being so brutally honest yeah. about how you want them to be and, and reminding them that their ability to be successful will be if they match that, if mm-hmm. not, they'll be better off someplace else. It, it kind of relates to the whole bad apple thing. Right. right. You know, if they come in and they're an apple that doesn't fit, you know, we're hiring green apples and you're a red apple. Help them find a place for red apples. Exactly. That's right. Kill them with clarity. Not that. That sounds like a racial <laughs> for apples. You know, we need all kinds of apples, but I mean, some kind of apples belong in some company and some don't in others. I don't want to offend any green or red <laughs> apples out there. <laughs> Perfect. That's great. So that's that's it in terms of questions this week. But send, please send us more questions at podcasts at tablegroup.com. That's yes, right. we'd love to get those. So we're going to wrap up today's podcast. I want to thank you for being with us. And we will look forward to talking to you next time on At The Table. God bless.